uh, welcome to this uh, 20th class in uh, our uh, uh, course physics of materials. Um, so, we will uh, take up from where we left off last class. So, in the uh, uh, last class we actually looked at the uh, Fermi Dirac distribution function, uh, we looked at the plot of the Fermi Dirac distribution function and we tried to understand what are the uh, various features of that function, what is it uh, trying to convey to us. In other words having arrived at that function, what is it that we can interpret uh, when we look at the uh, plot of that function, uh, what are uh, specific features associated with that function, uh, where is it that we see uh, uh, some changes uh, in behavior uh, of the electrons, uh, what does that represent um, and how is it that uh, uh, the electrons are uh, distributed across various energy levels uh, at a given temperature, uh, what variation we see there. Uh, also as you change the temperature what is the variation that you see there. So, uh, we have discussed this in a reasonable amount of detail, uh, what we will do is uh, uh, we will uh, uh, look at the po uh, fact that you know we have come here for a particular reason, uh, we have looked at this Fermi Dirac distribution for a particular reason. The reason being that uh, the original model uh, that we started off with apparently uh, the Drude model or the Drude Lorentz model seemed inadequate in some ways. So, that is why we arrived at the, uh, uh, we looked at an alternate model which was uh, given to us by Sommerfeld and uh, is called the Drude Sommerfeld model and in that context we came up with the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, we will now look at uh, it, uh, today's class we will start off first by looking at uh, uh, what is it that we have accomplished in this process uh, by coming over to the uh, Drude Sommerfeld model and hence having used the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, uh, more specifically we will compare the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution which was used for the uh, uh, classical model or the Drude model with the Fermi Dirac distribution which is being used by the Sommerfeld model. So, we will step back we will look at the, uh, uh, the plot of the Maxwell distribution uh, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution function uh, and uh, generalize it in, in a certain way, compare it with the uh, plot that we obtain for uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution and see what is it that uh, uh, we are additionally able to do now or uh, what changes we have actually uh, uh, incorporated. Uh, in the system by assuming that uh, it is the Fermi Dirac distribution that now uh, operates for the system. Okay. So, we will uh, step back and we will write down the same expression that we wrote for the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution a few classes ago uh, and make some modification to the expression. So, that it uh, 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 conveys the same information in a slightly different way in a, in, a, in a normalized way so to speak and then compare it with the Fermi Dirac distribution. Right. So, we will do that. So, if you look at the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Uh, we had uh, an expression that looked like this n i equals n by p e to the power minus e i by k b t. Okay. So, uh, this represented the number of states at uh, energy level e i or, or the number of uh, uh, electrons I am sorry the number of electrons in energy level e i that is given by the total number of electrons in the system by a function here called the partition function p. Uh, uh, and this uh, term here which is E power minus E i, this E i is the uh, energy level that we are looking at by the Boltzmann constants time t. Okay. So, uh, this is what we ended up getting. Uh, so, if you uh, if we made a plot of this, the plot looked something like this. And this is energy. So, energy levels E 0, E 1, E 2, E 3 and so on and uh, corresponding to uh, E 0 we had a certain N 0 number of uh, electrons, corresponding to E 1 we had an N 1 and so on and so we, ha we had actually a, a curve that looked like this. So, uh, this is how we would get all the various values of this is the actual number of uh, 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 electrons so to speak uh, uh, sitting at those various uh, uh, energy levels uh, that we have. And we found that you know uh, uh, as the uh, uh, um, so we would have 
smaller and smaller number of uh, electrons occupying uh, energy levels that are higher and higher in energy all right uh, and we said that you know this is at, uh, at a given temperature t at some temperature t we also uh, indicated that uh, if you raise this temperature so this is uh, let us just say this is uh, t1 if you went to a temperature t2 which is greater than t1 the uh, general tendency of this function uh, is is to create a situation where now uh, the lower energy levels will now have a little less number of electrons and as you get to higher and higher energy levels they will be able to ac accommodate more and more electrons. So, the uh, curve would look something like this. So, the second curve is at T 2 which is greater than T 1. So, at the lowest energy level you now have a little less number of electrons uh, occupying that uh, lower uh, uh, energy level and as you go to higher and higher energy level. So, if you see look at this energy level say some higher energy level here you can actually see that more electrons can now sit at that uh, energy level than, than they did before. So, you can have this many number of electrons relative to uh, what you had before. So, as you get to higher energy levels more electrons can be there and this is consistent with the fact that the energy of the system has gone up. So, since energy of the system has gone up uh, uh, the higher energy levels have to have more electrons that is the basic uh, uh, given that you are uh, talking of a system that has energy levels and so on uh, that is what is consistent with the uh, uh, with the information that energy of the uh, system has gone up overall. And when you say temperature has gone up that is what we are saying the temperature has gone up means energy in the system has gone up and the energy is contained in those electrons. So, therefore, those uh, electrons uh, uh, have to sit at higher energy levels. Uh, I mean assuming that we are only talking of electrons in that uh, solid uh, we are not looking at other uh, uh, information in the solid ok. So, this is how uh, this information is plotted uh, this is talks of number of electrons and, uh, uh, and that is the way it is done the same uh, uh, function can be written somewhat uh, slightly differently simply to make it look like a uh, it is so that it is uh, it is normalized and it now conveys a probability uh, distribution. So, we simply rewrite this in a slightly different way this is uh, uh, same as uh, saying p of e equals p of uh, uh, is some p 0 e to the power uh, minus e i by k b t. Okay, so, uh, all we are saying is this is some constant p 0 uh, and this is the probability of occupancy of an energy level at uh, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of probability of occupancy of uh, at the energy level E i ok. So, uh, and this is the you can I basically just say that you know you can uh, if you put n i by n uh, that gives you a fraction here and so on and then you can integrate it uh, this is uh, set up. So, that if you integrate this across all energy levels uh, it will become a 1 ok. So, so th in that sense we are normalizing it. So, that uh, integrated over all energy levels this would become 1. So, we can plot this uh, slightly differently. Uh, all I am going to do is uh, I am going to uh, uh, now plot uh, energy on the uh, x axis ok. So, I am uh, exchanging the axis now here here we had energy on the y axis uh, and the number of states on the uh, x axis. Uh, what I am uh, plotting now is uh, simply a slightly uh, swapped version of this where I am moving the energy to the x axis but I am not really plotting the uh, number of states on the y axis I am sort of plotting the uh, probability of occupancy of those states ok. So, that is what I am plotting. So, this p of e is what we are plotting here and this p of e will be such that it will go between 0 and 1 ok. And uh, uh, if you uh, uh, basically see uh, the way this function would behave is uh, at 0 Kelvin ok at absolute 0 uh, the uh, uh, lowest energy level available in the system. So, if you say E 0 uh, the probability of occupancy of that lowest energy level will be 100 percent at uh, the lowest uh, uh, temp I mean at absolute 0 and it will be uh, 0 for all the other energy levels ok. And as you raise the temperature it will begin to look like this. and so on ok. So, this is uh, so this is uh, T 0 less than T 1 less than T 2 less than T 3 
Okay. So, this is uh, so I am putting these two on the same uh, uh, nearby, so that you get an idea of how they uh, sort of relate to each other. Uh, this is how it will be with respect to energy and uh, uh, this is just a modified version of this plot. It is the same uh, equation uh, just modified uh, so that it is uh, it's normalized and then you can take uh, uh, the uh, integrated uh, so that it, uh, it ends up at 1 uh, across all energy levels. So, it is just a slightly modified version of this equation, but the basic form the basic information it is conveying uh, the uh, trend it is showing you is exactly the same nothing uh, none of those aspects have been uh, uh, changed in any uh, in any manner it is simply been uh, set up so that it uh, it becomes convenient for use later on that's it so uh, so this is how we derived it i have modified it main uh, with respect to the plot i have shifted the energy axis to the uh, x axis there here it is on the y axis it's become the x axis there and the uh, y axis is the uh, probability of occupancy okay so uh, that is the uh, function so, this is what the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is uh, uh, giving you, so, the, both of them are the same uh, information Maxwell Boltzmann uh, distribution. Um, we will uh, uh, now compare this distribution with what we obtain for the Fermi Dirac distribution okay? and we will put this information down and uh, we will compare the two of them. So, uh, once again we will write it here. Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and we will have the Fermi Dirac distribution here. Okay. Uh, so, these two are we are going to compare uh, in terms of the uh, uh, aspects of the distribution. Uh, that are uh, significantly different between the two of them. Uh, these are the specific points where they differ. First, this applies to classical particles, collection of classical particles. This applies to a collection of fermions. So, these are identical and distinguishable these are identical and indistinguishable. Okay. So, uh, these are the major uh, aspects that differ between the two of them uh, and in the uh, manner in which we have progressed in our uh, analysis so far, we started off by treating uh, uh, electrons as classical particles and therefore, employed the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics to see how they behave and on that basis uh, derived their uh, uh, derived equations to see uh, what is it, it represents in terms of uh, the property of the uh, uh, of a solid that contains electrons. And then we are now moving to a uh, system where we are uh, we are saying that okay we have some we had some problem by assuming this making this assumption. How about we try this assumption? Because electrons are uh, meeting all these features that they are fermions. So they are fermions uh, and they have they are identical and uh, indistinguishable. They they meet all the uh, criteria for being a uh, fermion. So we have uh, considered this uh, possibility. So uh, in terms of uh, model, this is the old uh, Drude model. and this is the Drude Sommerfeld model. Okay. So, these are the uh, uh, two. So, in terms of the plot we will just make the plots here. So, uh, we just uh, did this uh, 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 moment ago. So, this is at 0 Kelvin, this just coincides with the uh, y axis. I will call it T 0, this is T 1 greater than T 0. And 
this is T 2 greater than T 1. This is just a schematic, so uh, this is not really, uh, I mean you would have to actually plot it up to get the exact kind of a plot. So, just so long as you understand the uh, form of what it, what it is that we are drawing, uh, that should suffice. Uh, if you want the exact uh, plots, you need to draw them up to see what it is that we are actually getting. So, this is at T 3, which is greater than T 2. So, this is the behavior of this, uh, uh, okay, it will not going below this axis. So, this is the behavior of this function as we see it, okay. So, uh, uh, that is how we see it T 0, T 1, T 2, T 3 uh, and T 0 being 0 Kelvin when it coincides with the y axis. The Fermi Dirac distribution we uh, derived uh, last class and we designate that as f of e. We recognized uh, at that point that there is a certain value E f, okay. So, uh, that is uh, given by uh, uh, in, in this uh, plot uh, and so uh, if you want to write down this uh, equation, we can just write those equations down here, so that uh, we can follow what it is that we are plotting P of E equals P 0 e to the power minus E i by k b t. That is this plot that we have made here and this is uh, f of e uh, equals 1 by 1 plus e to the power e i minus e f by k b t. Okay, so, uh, this is what uh, this is the Fermi Dirac distribution function this is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution function. So, these are the two that are there in our system that we are comparing and this is the plot for this function uh, at as a function of. Uh, so, assuming T is fixed at 0 Kelvin, we get one plot, you raise the temperature, you get another plot, raise it further, you get the third plot, raise it even further, you get the fourth plot. So, that is how we have got these plots. Uh, the same thing we will do here, this is f of e um, and so we have plotted this as a function of energy. Uh, at 0 Kelvin, this is the plot that we would get. So, at 0 Kelvin, this is at uh, 0 Kelvin, T uh, 0 equals uh, 0 Kelvin. Uh, at uh, T 1, I just marked 0 0.5 here at T 1. we would get this plot. This is a T 2 which is greater than T 1. Okay, so, this is how it progresses. So, we have at various uh, uh, different temperatures, you would have uh, the probability of occupancy dropping to less than 1. Uh, at energy levels which are uh, lower and lower and lower as you raise the temperature. Okay. So, as the temperature keeps going up, this is what uh, we are beginning to see in this system, fine. Um, so, uh, we recognize that in the Fermi Dirac distribution, there is this uh, value E f which represents the uh, Fermi energy, which is what you see here E f. Okay. So, uh, that is the highest, uh, I described in last class that it is the highest energy level occupied by the electrons uh, at 0 Kelvin and at any other higher temperature uh, if, uh, higher than 0 Kelvin, it is no longer the highest energy level that is occupied, because energy levels above E f are also occupied. But uh, then the definition for the Fermi energy, you can see that here at higher energy levels, uh, the probability of occupancy of uh, an, an energy level higher than E f is non-zero. Okay, so, therefore, energy levels higher than uh, the Fermi energy level are being occupied at higher temperatures. So, uh, therefore, it is no longer the highest occupied energy level. But the way the function is defined, it would be the energy level where the probability of occupancy is 0 0.5. So, at 0 Kelvin, it is the highest energy level that is occupied. At higher uh, temperatures, it is the uh, energy level where the probability of occupancy is 0 0.5, fine. So, that is the definition for Fermi energy. So, now we have these two functions, uh, uh, whatever we have discussed uh, when we derived uh, the uh, uh, electronic conductivity 
and thermal conductivity as, be, uh, as we did when we uh, assumed that uh, the Drude model was working and therefore, we assumed that Maxwell Boltzmann statistics was working. Effectively, this is what we assumed. Uh, in other words, where you know in the calculations we were doing somewhere hidden in those calculations, the kinds of uh, parameters we used, the way we related the parameters to each other, uh, they were all some uh, somewhere in, in in a very fundamental sense we're using this information. All right, uh, and the major issue that we found was the contribution of uh, the electronic contribution to specific heat that uh, the Drude model predicted was about two orders magnet of uh, of magnitude higher than what was actually observed experimentally. Okay. So, uh, so that was one piece of information we had. So, now what is it that uh, when you look at this picture, what is it uh, that this picture conveys to us in terms of the specific heat behavior that we are uh, looking at. Now, uh, what it is conveying to us is that fact that in the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, um, when you raise the temperature, okay, when you raise the temperature, all the electrons that are present in the system are in a position to absorb some energy and uh, go up to the uh, such that the overall temperature of the system goes up. Okay, so, all the electrons in, a, uh, in that system are able to absorb energy such that uh, the uh, um, uh, overall energy of the system goes up and hence therefore, the temperature goes up. So, this is the uh, 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 this is the uh, uh, manner in which the system is responding to a raise in temperature. Okay, so, therefore, when you have a large collection of electrons you have to provide enough energy that all the electrons are in a position to uh, pick up that energy and only then the overall temperature of the system goes up. Okay. So, that is the uh, basic idea in the uh, Maxwell Boltzmann uh, uh, analysis or rather the uh, when you assume Maxwell Boltzmann statistics holds uh, that is what is happening at a, uh, at a fundamental level. All right. So, all the all the electrons uh, uh, the uh, the way the statistics work works is basically that uh, there is no restriction placed on the number of electrons that can be at any at any given energy level right. So, therefore, all of them can be at the lowest energy level and as you raise the temperature all of them can attempt to go up in energy levels because ahead of them there are all vacant states there and there is no restriction on how many electrons can sit in that state. Therefore, they can all move forward in energy and therefore, they all attempt to uh, pick up this energy level you see a distribution such that the average distribution uh, the average energy corresponding to all those electrons corresponds to the temperature of that uh, uh, material. Okay. So, this is what we are seeing here um, and when we are doing it this manner in the in the manner that I have just described to you, it, it appears that we are overestimating the amount of energy we have to provide to raise the temperature by a certain amount. So, that is the specific heat right, specific heat simply says what is the amount of energy you have to provide to the system to raise the temperature of the system by a certain uh, uh, by an incremental value. Okay. So, so so, let us say 1 degree Kelvin, you want to raise uh, go from 0 Kelvin to 1 Kelvin or 10 Kelvins to 11 Kelvins. If you want to do this, if you want to raise the temperature of the system by 1 degree Kelvin, what is the amount of energy you have to provide? According to this model, when you make this kind of an assumption and you find that this is the behavior of the system as you raise the temperature of the system, this model says that all the electrons in that uh, in that material can uh, can uh, gain energy and therefore, will attempt to gain that energy as you raise the temperature of the system. So, you have to provide energy sufficient for that process. Okay. So, a huge number of electrons are there you have to provide energy sufficiently, uh, so that all of them can gain that energy such that the average temperature of the system goes up. If a very large fraction of the electrons are sitting at a very low uh, energy level and with only a very small number of them gain energy, your average temperature is not going to go up by 1 Kelvin you have to provide energy for all the electrons to move up in energy level. So, that uh, the temperature goes up to 1 Kelvin or goes up by 1 Kelvin. So, that is what you are assuming here. If you shift to the Fermi Dirac distribution, what we find is that the uh, at 0 Kelvin the probability of occupancy of states is uh, 1 all the way up to the Fermi energy and then it drops to 0. All right. Now, uh, the when you plot this as a function of temperature, what you notice uh, is that um, as you raise the temperature not all of the electrons participate in the process of uh, gaining energy. Okay. So, that is a very important uh, point that we need to uh, notice that in this uh, in this distribution uh, not every electron participates in the process of gaining of energy. So, as you raise the temperature of the system not every electron is uh, participating in that process. Why is that why is that the case if you look at this distribution the uh, uh, the fact is that we, we have also assumed here for example, that the information that uh, which is very important here is that Pauli's exclusion principle applies.
okay and the, in fact that is why that is why it's a fermion it's a, it's a fermion because it meets all those characteristics it pauli's exclusion principle applies so when pauli's exclusion principle applies uh, we uh, we built into this uh, statistical distribution uh, we accepted as we built uh, this idea that there are first of all only a limited number of states at any given energy level we don't have an infinite number of states on top of that we uh, accept the fact that since pauli's exclusion principle applies with a limited set of states you can only put a limited set of electrons on those states you cannot arbitrarily put twice as many electrons or five times as many electrons or thousand times as many electrons on those states there are states they represent actually when you go down to the more fundamental understanding of the system they represent all the quantum mechanical uh, numbers of those uh, of the system of the particle and therefore when uh, if each state can be occupied only by one electron you cannot put more than one electron per state so when you have a finite number of states at the low at a low energy level you can only put a finite number of electrons on that uh, on that state you go to the next energy level but you have a large collection of electrons right you have a large collection of electrons so you have to start building the system up that way you take the lowest energy level you fill it up with electrons then uh, you find you still have additional electrons available you take the next higher energy level you fill it up with electrons you still have more electrons available go to e3 you fill it up with electrons and go on till you reach ef when you finally run out of electrons okay so we need to look little bit more carefully at what this picture represents when t0 is 0 kelvin when uh, the temperature is 0 kelvin all the states okay that is very important to note all the states in energy levels from e0 up to ef all of them have been filled okay so there is no vacant state available between the lowest energy level that you have available here and the fermi energy level that that is there okay every state that is available between these two energy levels has been filled completely that is why the probability of occupancy of those states is 1 if there are 50 states there are 50 particles at that energy level they are full so there is no vacant state between the lowest energy level that you have here which we will call e0 and the highest energy level that you have here which is ef at 0 kelvin so at 0 kelvin everything is full right now when you raise the uh, temperature of the system uh, i said that you know the way we need to understand raising the temperature of the system is that electrons in the system are gaining energy okay so that is what we uh, we mean when we say that uh, the energy of the system has gone up for an electron to gain energy it would represent in this picture uh, the idea that the electron has to move to a higher energy level so it is previously sitting at say e10 is the energy level it is sitting at you now give it some energy it has to move to e11 or e12 or e13 somewhere there it has to move only then that electron has actually gained that energy right or it is able it is only then the picture is consistent with the idea that the electron has gained energy if you are arranging the energy levels in increasing order if it was sitting at e10 now you have given it a little bit of energy depending on what uh, quantum of energy you have given it what amount of energy you have given it it has to go to e11 or e12 or e13 somewhere there it has to go for it to gain that energy and stay within the constraints of the system because it cannot just just gain energy and be somewhere in space right it has to be within that system that system has already placed all these constraints that there are fixed number of states available within the system and those states have a restriction that there can only be a fixed number of electrons on those states that is the system within which these electrons have to operate they cannot operate outside of the system now if i take an electron that is sitting here okay so let me just say some arbitrary e let's say this is e3 okay an electron sitting in e3 i try to raise the uh, temperature of the system when you try to raise the temperature of the system this e3 let's say it can go up uh, to e5 let's say it, it, the amount of energy you have provided to the system is sufficient for this e3 to go to e5 that is the amount of energy you are providing to the system let's just say that that's all you are doing when you do that this electron at e3 will attempt to go to e5 what is the problem it faces the problem it faces is that at 0 kelvin e5 is already full it has a certain number of states available all those states are already full okay so there is no vacant state available at e5 therefore the electron at e3 even though in principle it could have picked up that energy that delta energy that you have provided into the system some you know some so many electron volts of energy you have provided into the system even though in principle you can say that it is sitting at some energy level you have given let's say 3 electron volts to it so it can move to a new energy level which is uh, e3 plus 3 electron volts let's say let's say that that's that's the, uh, the kind of picture you are looking at but at e3 plus 3 electron volts you will have a new energy level which is let's say e5 
E 5 already the states are full. Therefore, the electron at E 3 is incapable now uh, in, to, uh, in participating in this energy gain process. It is prevented from gaining that energy, because to gain that energy it has to go to a new location, that new location is already full. There is no vacant spot in that new location. So, even though the energy is coming into the system, this electron at E 3 cannot participate in the gain of that energy. Okay. So, therefore, electrons uh, at these lower energy levels in a similar manner are prevented or are not in a position to accept the energy being provided to the system from the external source. So, when you raise the we have just started from the extreme case that it is 0 Kelvin. Okay. So, because that conveys to us the picture much more clearly, we will just extend the argument to higher temperatures. So, at 0 Kelvin we are faced with this situation that all the energy states are full up to uh, the Fermi energy level. So, at any lower energy level we are uh, the electrons at that lower energy levels face this situation that ahead of them at energy levels just higher than where they are all the states are already full. So, if you give them a small amount of energy they are they will attempt to get only to that energy levels which are just marginally ahead of them and marginally ahead of them the states are already full. So, they cannot move. Okay. So, therefore, they do not participate in the gain of energy. So, this continues till you get very close to the Fermi energy. Now, let us look at electrons which are at or very near the Fermi energy. The electrons which are at or very near the Fermi energy ahead of them okay, ahead of them are energy levels where there are empty states. Okay. In fact, at 0 Kelvin at 0 Kelvin at uh, E equal to E f you have finally, filled the uh, uh, states with the last set of electrons that you have available and at any energy level above E f the states are completely empty. Okay. So, the probability of occupancy is 0 at that point in time uh, at uh, energy levels above E f. Therefore, above E f at 0 Kelvin the states are completely empty. Okay. So, now when you try to raise the temperature of the system marginally by providing a little bit of energy into the system electrons which are very close to E f okay, very close to E f or at E f for them ahead of them the energy states are vacant. Okay. So, if you provide a small amount of energy let us say in again if you use the same uh, description say uh, it is now at E f and you have provided it 3 electron volts let us say then those electrons which are at E f uh, if they look at E f plus 3 electron volts ahead of them the states are all vacant. So, therefore, these electrons can now accept that energy. Okay. So, therefore, when you take a system that is following this uh, Fermi Dirac statistic and you look at uh, you try to raise the temperature of that system by providing a little bit of energy uh, you find that the electrons which are very close to the Fermi energy are able to participate in that process. Whereas, all the electrons which are below the Fermi uh, which are distinctly below the Fermi energy level are incapable of participating in the process. So, that is why you see this picture that uh, if, if I go to a temperature T 1 which is greater than 0 Kelvin you find that uh, in now in this case you know this energy level this uh, this band of uh, we will not okay, let us not use the word band because that means something else elsewhere this range of energy values. Okay, this range of energy values corresponds to the uh, electrons which are now in a position to shift forward to higher energy levels. Therefore, the probability of occupancy of these electrons at these uh, energy levels begins to decrease and the probability of occupancy of electron levels above E f begins to increase. Okay. So, uh, in this uh, system in this picture we find that uh, if you have a large collection of electrons then a very uh, high fraction of that collection of electrons. So, if you have a million electrons Okay. So, 99 percent of those electrons are at energy levels distinctly below the highest energy level E f only a very small percentage just for just for numbers sake I mean we, uh, without uh, too much specificity on that number uh, something like a very small percentage maybe 1 percent or something like that are the number of electrons which are very close to that Fermi energy level they are the ones that participate in this energy gain process. Okay. So, therefore, they move forward. Okay. So, now uh, and this this continues. So, once you have got uh, T uh, T 1 we are reached this situation when you raise it further to T 2 a few more electrons from a slightly lower energy level can also still participate and they are able to move forward. Okay. And and this is a sort of a cumulative process when you when you move uh, let us say uh, an electron at E f to an en energy level higher than it then an electron which is little lower energy level can move to an energy level E f. Okay. So, th so, they can all move forward progressively as the at, as it begins to move. Right. So, uh, that is what is happening it is it is in, in a sense it is analogous to saying you know you have a uh, I, we were drawing this analogy to a container containing you know sand or water or something like that. 
the, uh, the disturbance that we cause to that uh, system is usually something that you see at the surface, the wave occurs in the surface if you want to disturb it. Okay. So, it, it is a very loose analogy at that point in time, but it sort of conveys the idea to you that you know something at the surface is participating in the process, when you do a marginal, uh, when you just only marginally uh, you know tap the surface. Okay, so, uh, when if everything is frozen still at 0 Kelvin, you marginally tap the surface, only that surface participates is the way you would you want to look at it. So, uh, this is the way in which this is occurring in the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution. So, now if you compare the two of them, the difference begins uh, becomes uh, apparent. Uh, when you use the Maxwell Boltzmann statistic, uh, when you try to raise the temperature, all the electrons in the system are participating in the process of gain in energy. Okay when you use the Fermi Dirac distribution, a very large fraction of the electrons are not participating in the energy uh, increase uh, process. Okay. So, to repeat in the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, if you raise the temperature, all the electrons participate in the raise in temperature or are in a position to participate in the gain in uh, temperature. Therefore, for the same gain in temperature, uh, same change in temperature, you have to provide a fairly large amount of energy. Okay. A, 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 a certain amount of energy you have to provide for the entire set of electrons to participate in the process of gaining energy and therefore, raising the temperature of the system. When you go here, a very large fraction of the electrons in fact, do not participate in the gain uh, energy gain process, they are passive to the energy gain process, simply because they have uh, no means of participating in the process. Therefore, when you try to raise the temperature of the system, uh, most of them simply do not participate in the process, a very small fraction very close to the Fermi energy is the only set of electrons that participates in the process. Okay. So, uh, by simply uh, and therefore, you find that you know uh, in, in terms for the same change in temperature, simply because you had a very large set of electrons participating in this uh, energy gain process and a very small set of electrons participating in this energy gain process, the amount of energy you have to provide here for the same change in temperature is significantly larger than the amount of energy that you have to provide here for the same change in temperature. Okay. So, to repeat the amount of uh, since large number of electrons are participating in this energy gain process here, the amount of energy to uh, attain a similar change in temperature is relatively large here compared to a situation here, where a very small number of electrons are participating in the energy gain process. Okay. So, therefore, a small amount of energy is required here. The specific heat by definition is exactly that same piece of information, it is what is the amount of energy that you have to provide to the system, so that the uh, temperature of the system goes up by a certain marginal amount, that is the uh, basic concept that is captured in the specific heat of a substance. Uh, and therefore, we can see that simply because these two systems differ in the number of electrons participating in the energy gain process, the your estimate for specific heat if you use the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics is going to be large, because you need more energy for the same change in temperature. Your estimate for uh, specific heat is going to be significantly less if you use the Fermi Dirac statistics, because you are you, uh, a very small number of electrons will participate in the energy gain process, a small amount of energy is required for the same change in temperature relatively speaking. Okay. So, in this fundamental sense, this is a very descriptive uh, uh, concept that we have looked at so far um, in terms of comparison, uh, we will try and put some numbers down to this a little later, because we have to develop a few more concepts before we, we do that, but uh, uh, even as, as a concept right now, uh, it we immediately understand uh, how by employing the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution uh, on a set of electrons in a solid, we are able to correct one major anomaly of the Drude model. Okay. So, the Drude model uh, which used which effectively used the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics uh, in it uh, was overestimating the specific heat uh, uh, the electronic contribution to specific heat. Okay. It was overestimating the electronic contribution to specific heat by a factor of 100. So, the Drude model originally was overestimating the electronic contribution to specific heat by a factor of 100. And uh, uh, we find now that by using the Drude Sommerfeld model, we are able to dramatically reduce the electronic contribution to specific heat. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, in, and in this sense, the Drude Sommerfeld model immediately corrects one of the major anomalies of the Drude model, the original model, original Drude model. So, by shifting from a classical particle, by shifting the description of electrons in a solid from that of a classical particle to a to that of a fermion. And by shifting that description, we have shifted the function that applies to those particles. And because this function behaves this way, uh, we find that one of the uh, parameters that it predicts 
is now significantly less than the prediction that was made here. Okay, and it turns out that this this kind of a prediction is much more accurate. Okay, so therefore, uh, the purpose of our exercise, uh, which was to address the difficulties that the Drude model had, that was the purpose of this exercise. Uh, we uh, uh, we found that it was having some shortcomings, including this uh, uh, prediction of this uh, specific heat, and uh, therefore that was the purpose of this exercise to see if there was a better model, and that's how Sommerfeld uh, tried out this better model. He took the basic idea of the Drude model, the basic uh, approach of the Drude model he still maintained, but he just basically uh, recognized the fact that it is not, it may not be appropriate to treat the electrons as classical particles because for all the character uh, characteristics that they have, uh, they are not really classical particles based on the characteristics they have. They uh, display the quantum mechanical behavior much more significantly. Okay, so uh, there is a tendency for them to show uh, quantum mechanical behavior much more significantly. Uh, as as I mentioned before, when we looked at the history of quantum mechanics, in a sense, you can try and look at the quantum mechanical behavior of even larger objects, uh, day-to-day -day objects, and so on. It is just that when you look at larger and larger objects, uh, the uh, effect of the quantum mechanical uh, calculations becomes very minuscule. Therefore, when we treat them as classical uh, objects, we treat them as classical objects that we can identify, we can locate, we can move and uh, handle, and so on. Uh, the that it is it is a, in, in a sense it is an approximation but it's a very very good approximation because the quantum mechanical effects are negligible to non exist i mean nearly non existent at that state from our perspective okay so therefore it is okay when you talk of uh, but when you go down to the electronic scale when you go down to a subatomic scale and you look at electrons then the quantum mechanical effects seem to become very uh, significant and therefore the phenomena that we see uh, at an electronic level in terms of how it gains energy, how it loses energy, how it interacts with the surroundings and so on. When you look at that phenomena, if you simply apply classical type of uh, understanding on it, the predictions it makes turn out wrong, uh, the uh, predictions that we find are turn out to be wrong. So therefore, uh, we are forced to accept the fact that you know, at that level, quantum mechanical behavior is much more significant and therefore, whatever equations go along with the quantum mechanical behavior, we have to utilize. Only then the uh, we only then we are capturing the uh, uh, facets of uh, the behavior of those particles appropriately only and therefore only then when when those equations work out whatever result we get only then it is uh, likely that that uh, e final result that we get will be uh, accurate and we will be matching the experimental data that we have uh, much more uh, accurately fine and so that is the basic idea so that is what somerfield has done somerfield recognized that uh, it is not really appropriate to use classical uh, mechanics. So, he just tried out this quantum mechanical approach and uh, it was around that time that uh, the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution had also been uh, uh, proposed. So, this is uh, in the 1927 time frame. Uh, so, around that time this uh, 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 Fermi Dirac distribution had been uh, indicated independently. He just took the Fermi Dirac distribution and imposed it on this collection of electrons which are sitting in the solid. Okay, so, that is basically what he did. right? Uh, this was a much older piece of work, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is an 1870 piece of work. So, this is about 50 years, 50, 60 years uh, apart in time frame uh, in terms of the distributions itself and then uh, in terms of usage this is what has, uh, has been done. Now, uh, I also mentioned that you know, uh, uh, so we see now immediately how, we, how it is that this model is an improvement on this model, how the Drude Sommerfeld model becomes an improvement on the Drude model. Okay, uh, immediately from these plots you can see the difference. However, I also pointed out that uh, this is not the complete picture uh, because this is simply talks of the probability of occupancy. Okay. It does not tell you how many states are available at each of those energy levels. For you to actually put a number down for specific heat, we have to have that, uh, we have to have an idea of uh, very descriptively I am telling you that, uh, you know, number uh, that electrons very close to the Fermi energy are participating in this energy gain process. Um, that is descriptively it is fine and it does convey this idea that this model is, uh, is, uh, is refining something that is not visible here. Okay? So, that is lost here in fact. So, this model definitely refines that and is, is able to capture uh, that particular subtlety of this process. But uh, what this model, uh, the way it is currently shown to you, what it is not capturing is uh, what it is not indicating to you is the number of states that are actually available at each of these energy levels and that is a very important piece of information. because only when you have that, can you actually put numbers down to how many electrons have uh, done this uh, participated in this process. I can only tell you now that uh, electrons close to this have participated, 
but what is that number? I mean, if if there are only five states at E0, there are five, 50 states at E1, uh, and there are 500 million states at EF, then uh, obviously the uh, the contribution of those states uh, and they are all fully occupied. Then uh, then you will find that out of uh, you know 500 and million plus 10, 500 million are participating in the process. That is not really useful for us because that is uh, that still doesn't help us uh, understand the process. So we need to know how many uh, states are available at each of these energy levels and therefore get an understanding of how many states are actually available very close to the Fermi energy level or at the Fermi energy level and we need to understand that uh, this picture is already there with us that tells us the probability of occupancy. When you have the number of states also thrown into this picture then we can actually do a calculation which says that now you raise the temperature of the system uh, what is the amount of energy that has been absorbed by the system to raise the, uh, to attain that same temperature uh, change and uh, what is the number of electrons that have participated in this process. Okay. So, that is a piece of information that we need to uh, do. Okay. So, that is, uh, that is the detail that we have to provide. So, in the next few classes that is what we will attempt to do. Okay. So, the next few classes we will try and get in this picture. To do that uh, what we are going to do in the immediate next class is to uh, uh, we are going to actually see that you know uh, we have to refine the picture of uh, what is it that uh, a solid is. Okay. So, uh, so far we have said that it is simply uh, that you have an ionic core. So, we have a set of ionic cores which is simply what I mean if you have silver uh, silver atom we are saying as we assume that let us say silver atom behaves in a univalent manner which is just an assumption that we make based on its uh, standard behavior. So, we have silver uh, so we say that all these locations based on the crystal structure. Okay. So, whatever uh, if any metal that you take you look at its crystal structure. So, at those crystal lattice locations you have those uh, the metal atoms okay, and they are uh, rigidly fixed. Uh, we are saying that they are not just metal atoms they are actually meta metal ions and so therefore uh, and that is the core the uh, ionic core and the electron that it has released is free to run around through the solid. So, that electron is running around in the in the uh, in the solid. So, this is how the electron is running around. So, this is the model that we have used okay. physically this is the model we have used the electrons are freely running around uh, the one electron that every uh, atom has released is freely running around. At those locations we have ionic cores which correspond to this uh, A g plus uh, ions. So, these A g plus ions are all at all the lattice locations these electrons are now uh, running across. In our uh, Drude model uh, original model we basically said that uh, it is a flat potential throughout this uh, system there is no there is no preference for this electron to be at any one location or any other location as it moves around it does not it only sees an overall averaged behavior overall averaged uh, uh, atmosphere so to speak. Uh, and it has no greater tendency to be at any one location no greater tendency to be an, at any other location it just freely runs around across this entire solid right. Uh, what we need to recognize is that when you have ionic cores the uh, if you if you take even a, a single line of these ionic cores as you move from left to right the uh, potential that the electron will, uh, will experience at each location is going to be somewhat different because these ionic cores because it is going to get close to an ionic core then move away from the ionic core get close to the next ionic core move away from the next ionic core and so on. So, therefore, uh, it is not really accurate to say that there is no variation in potential in the system it, there is we just sim we simply have to accept it we cannot ignore it beyond a point. Okay. So, what we will do in, in our next class is to try and build a very real uh, a much more realistic picture of how the potential exists in the solid. Okay. So, uh, and we will uh, we will see that uh, uh, that there is a way in which we could probably draw we will take a linear collection of uh, uh, ionic cores and we will see what is a more realistic way of depicting the potential uh, as you move from location to location uh, the potential that an electron will experience as it moves from location to location uh, when you when it is uh, facing a set of ionic cores arranged in, uh, in a linear fashion. Okay. So, we will see a realistic picture of this uh, potential uh, versus position then we will see uh, we will find that it is not necessary I mean that is that is a fairly detailed picture. What we will do is we will uh, we will uh, uh, recognize that we need not use the complete detail as it is, but we can make a very good approximation of that same potential uh, uh, potential versus function uh, versus position uh, picture. We will make a very good approximation of this potential versus uh, a position uh, picture and uh, we will make the approximation such that 
for our analysis uh, we will find it much easier to handle okay so we will make that approximation and since we will, that will make our analysis easier we will be able to uh, uh, write the mathematics corresponding to that and come up with the uh, with a better understanding of or better predictions of what the electron is going to do depending on where it is and depending on what it is capable of doing okay so that is the picture we will have to draw so we will start next class by looking at and attempting to come up with a much more uh, realistic picture of uh, the potential versus position that an electron will experience and we will come up with a more sensible uh, uh, more acceptable approximation of that uh, picture so that the main details of that potential versus uh, position function uh, is captured uh, main details are captured but at the same time uh, computationally and uh, uh, conceptually it is much easier to, for us to follow what is happening within that system so that uh, we will reduce the uh, level of detail a little bit but at the same time we will capture all the major uh, details okay so we will do that and only only after we do that we will start we will start uh, we will get into a position where we can start answering this uh, uh, additional question that we have now put which is how many states are there at an, a given energy level okay so that is an information we don't yet have we will need to get there to do that as a first step we will need this potential uh, uh, approximation for potential in a in a solid okay so in the next class we will do that and from there we will take it so with that we'll halt for today thank you <laughs>